I am completely thrilled to let you guys know that Amaze are the sponsors for this very video. Want to get yourself a Tesla Model S played with taxes and shipping included for US winners and at the same time help the charity reverb? Well, we're going to be chatting about that later on in the video. Otherwise, go and click that link down in the description. Take yourself back to the arcades of the mid 90s. Mortal Kombat spews out with its gory fatalities. The Simpsons and the Turtles are dominating the licensed beat em up craze. Street Fighter 2 is still pulling in the most dedicated of the arcade regulars. And of course, you got plenty of light gun games with the likes of Area 51, Virtua Cop and Time Crisis. We don't have much time. Get into the castle and rescue Rachel. But in the middle of the world's worst mixtape of bleeps and bloops and kids crying under the realization that the crane games prizes are just too heavy, one machine always grabbed the attention and in a lot of ways it outlived the majority of classic arcade games with its excellent visual style, its often crazily oversized cabinet and of course, its music. Daytona USA dropped into the arcades in 1994, it became an instant hit. Sega reported that it was one of the company's most successful arcade games ever released and has since become the arcade's most iconic racing game. Sure. Getting exact figures are a little hard to find considering the game has been re-released so many times, but I think we can all agree that it's super iconic. A game that should be lagging in the slipstream compared to other games, yet no matter how impressive or technical the competition is, over 25 years later it still sucks you in and is truly unbeatable. But why is this? Well, to answer that, we're going to need to go back to the beginning and find out how it got made, who made it, what part of Sega tried to stop its creation, the huge rivalry it had at the time, the ups and downs of its many, many ports, its sequels and its spiritual successors. And most importantly, looking at the games themselves. This is the complete history of Daytona USA. Welcome to Slopes Game Room. Here's a question. Who here also thinks that all of those NASCAR drivers that drop 5,375,000 gallons of fuel every year at the Indy 500 should switch out their car for a nice, reliable and safe Tesla Model S played? Well, thankfully, because of today's sponsor, Omaze, all of those NASCAR drivers can be in for a chance on winning one of these lovely automobiles. So how does this all work? Well, Omaze are a company that give away insane prizes like this, and at the same time, they donate money to different charities all around the world. This sustainable approach to fundraising means that nonprofits can spend less time and money raising funds and instead focus on serving the needs of their community. And right now, not only will you potentially be able to drive around in this pearl white 390 mile range electric car with an under 2 second 0 to 60, 1000 horsepower engine, and a top speed of over 200 miles per hour. And you're going to be doing it knowing that you help the charity Reverb, a charity that partners with musicians, festivals, and venues to green their concerts. Their work makes a real positive impact on the environment, including the elimination of 3 million plus single-use plastic water bottles and concerts and eliminating over 180,000 tonnes of CO2 through their music climate revolution campaign. It doesn't get much better than this, does it? Click that link below. Go and possibly win yourself a Tesla and support an awesome charity at the same time.
The year was 1992, and the incredible Yu Suzuki had just struck gold yet again with the release of AM2 super impressive Virtua Racing, hitting the arcades and of course a wide variety of consoles. When you look back, it's easy to see that Nintendo is the main competition to the big blue house that is Sega, but in the arcades, it was a very different story. Sure, Nintendo had a presence in the arcades, a pretty good presence actually, with games like the Cruising franchise. However, in the arcades, the real competition to Sega was Namco. Anything Sega could do, Namco could do better. Sega can do anything better than Namco. Yes, they can. No, they can't. Yes, they can. No, they can't. Yes, they can. If anything was going to be showing the brute force that is Sega, Virtua Racing is going to be that thing. Sure, they're still very impressive for the time Namco developed Winning Run series, which started all the way back in the late 80s, was indeed a showstopper at the time. However, by the time that this came out, it was quickly forgotten. The arcade space was brutal, and Suzuki-san made an excellent choice here, putting the newcomer to the company, Toshihiro Nagoshi, on the job for this one, teaching him the all-important arcade side of the company as he went along. But as great as that was, that was the Model 1 arcade board, new at the time of course, technically actually still being worked on whilst Virtua Racing was being worked on. But Virtua Racing, why stop there? Almost as soon as the game was released in August of 1992 in Japan, the very next month, Sega announced that it would be teaming up with engineering group GE Aerospace to make an even better arcade unit, eventually known as the Model 2, which was one month before Western Shores even got Virtua Racing. The relationship between these two companies was a strange yet brilliant one. Sega, like all good video game companies, always wanted to do better and General Electric Aerospace, well they kinda needed to venture out to pastures new. You see, the company, which was located in Daytona Beach, directly opposite the Daytona International Speedway, was actually more well known for creating military simulated programs. Tanks, helicopters, fighter jets, all that explosive stuff. And when they wasn't doing that, they were creating space simulations for NASA astronauts. These were obviously incredibly expensive machines that went into the millions that were of course made for a very niche market. To combat this, a demo team of the company recreated that Daytona International Speedway that they were directly opposite, dropped some Formula 1 cars inside of that simulation and started showing off what they could do on a much smaller scale to video game companies such as Sega back in 1990 who were obviously very impressed. The problem was, it was all still way, way, way too high of an asking price for any kind of arcade unit. Because of this, a much cheaper chip was produced by the company and from that, Sega reverse engineered it and ended up creating an even cheaper chip themselves, apparently to the equivalent of about $50. This new chip had the ability to be mass produced and between the two companies, they were able to implement all of this into the brand spanking new Model 2 arcade board. The time had come. The hardware was being created, the partnership was strong. All they needed now was a game. Sega always did things differently, where a lot of companies would make the hardware whilst getting advice from the game designers as to what they wanted to see on said hardware. Sega found success in creating their games at the same time as creating their hardware, in-house at least. A meeting was set up featuring Yu Suzuki and the head of Sega from Japan, America and Europe were all in attendance. Of course, the racing genre seemed like the perfect fit after Virtua Racing, but considering Considering Virtua Racing didn't do quite as well in America as it did in Europe or Japan due to that country not exactly following Formula 1 as much as the rest, a new American-centric game was suggested. NASCAR Boy oh boy do Americans love NASCAR and thankfully for Sega, you know what the Japanese like? they like American pastime, so in the eyes of most in the room, it seemed like the perfect choice. No arcade games of note had taken advantage of this hugely popular sport yet, and hello, that company that helped make the Model 2, didn't they just show off the Daytona circuit only two years prior? 
all were in agreement, a NASCAR game it is, except for Victor Leslie, the original president of Sega Europe. Americans love NASCAR, Japan loves what the Americans love, but European gamers in the 90s? What the hell is a NASCAR? Thankfully in this instance, nobody in the room really cared what we European folk wanted. We were responsible for the lowest intake of arcade revenue as a whole anyway. And heck, I am sure we can still, what, well, kind of turn a profit with this one? We may not know much about the sport, but at least the name NASCAR is at least kind of recognizable to some. Well, sadly for us, Tom Petty, the head of Sega of America, who was no doubt extremely excited about this new game concept, came up with a new idea to make it even more obscure for the Europeans. Instead of getting a NASCAR license, why not get the Daytona license instead? Now, for people outside of the world of stock car racing like us Europeans, what Sega just did was actually quite ingenious. They didn't take the governing body of stock car racing, aka NASCAR, similar I suppose to the Football Association or the International Federation of American Football, but instead they took that particular sport's most popular event, the Daytona 500, similar I suppose to the FIFA World World Cup or the Super Bowl. Not only was this arguably more recognizable in the States, but more importantly, it was far less expensive. No names, no actual car makes, no sponsors. It was cheap, 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 and it was simple. Once again, Yu Suzuki, the producer of the game, put Toshihiro Nagoshi on the case in his first full directorial role, and after a trip to America, Tom Petty gave Nagoshi-san some tickets to a NASCAR race, and after that, it all clicked. It was time for Sega to take control of the arcades once again, with a very simple instruction from the suits up top. Make a racing game that's better than Ridge Racer. The rivalry between the two companies was in full swing once again, more so than ever before actually with the release of Ridge Racer. Nagoshi-san became obsessed buying every book that he could, watching every video that he could. NASCAR became his new go-to addiction. Of course, a lot of the team was still in the previous boat after working on Virtua Racing, continuing to be fascinated within the world of Formula One, which, to be honest, was more popular in Japan anyway, but they too did what they could in order to get engrossed in everything NASCAR. One member of the team, Makoto Asaki, actually ended up watching the film Days of Thunder no less than 100 times, as well as buying himself his own sports car too in order to get to grips with the feel of the game. It goes without saying that Sega and AM2 know how to make good arcade racers, and because of their previous work on games such as Virtua Racing, the development actually went along quite smoothly. The team visited the Daytona racetrack several times. They got to experience it at full speed. They took tours of the location, and Nagoshi-san himself even walked around the entire track on foot in order to get a feel for how steep those turns actually were. All of this research helped shape the game to make it what it would eventually become. The biggest issues were actually in the texture mapping department. The team had never done this type of thing before, and it actually turned out to be quite a hard thing to do. But of course, they got it done. And after it being shown at the Amusement Machine Show in Tokyo in August of 1993, it was obvious that it was going to be a hit. Roaring Star! The first test run of the game started back in August of 1993 at set locations in Japan where it was obviously received very, very well before being pushed out internationally and straight out of the gate, it did very, very well. At its most basic level, it's a racing game that forces you to go as fast as possible in order to hit the next checkpoint and increase your time. It rewards great driving and pushes you to become a better driver using your brake on those tight turns instead of just holding down the accelerator. It's a game that needs to be experienced to understand why it feels so good, and even if driving games aren't your thing, you will very quickly get to grips with this one. 
It's the age-old saying, easy to learn and tough to master. A quick tap of the brake if you've chosen automatic transmission or shifting of the gears in manual in conjunction with turning allows the car to power slide, of course. This takes away a lot of the realism but provides an unforgettable and easy to pull off arcade-like experience that's really hard to master on the later courses of which it gives you free courses to choose from, and those range from the simple over -like track that NASCAR fans were used to before becoming more complex. Each track is a perfect stepping stone to the next, and with its 20, 30 or even 40 cars on the track at once, no matter how much you master them, it's always a nail-biting experience that not only plays well, but looks stunning. It may have had less textures than its predecessor Virtua Racing, but this helps it become a fully 60 frames per second experience that very much showcased why this sort of thing was so important. Plus, it didn't matter anyway, because the texture mapping technology blew people away. It's a game that stood the test of time, and even though there is no denying the fact that the Namco rival Ridge Racer is also a great game, Daytona was the unique experience never seen before that dominated the arcades on a worldwide scale. Yes, even for us clueless Brits. In fact, it did so well that I'm not even sure I ever saw the stand-up or single sit-down cabinets, but I can remember in quite a few instances at arcades and bowling alleys seeing the dual cabinet and the eight-player cabinet too. It took up a lot of room, but it was worth that floor space. As stated, part of the cabinet's incredible charm came from Takanubo Mitsuyoshi's amazing soundtrack. He actually added vocals to the soundtrack, and he did this very thing by using them as samples and then looping those samples to actually make a full song, and it ended up becoming a right earworm. <laughs> One of the reasons those vocal elements were added was due to that constant desire to one-up the Ridge Racer game, and it did just that. In fact, the corny soundtrack was so memorable and well-received that Mitsuyoshi-san ended up becoming Sega's go-to guy for several other vocal-led projects, including adding vocals to Virtua Fighter and, of course, Sonic Team's Burning Rangers. The fight between Sega and Namco continued on in the arcades with Daytona and Ridge Racer, and that that fight continued on as they left the arcades as both games became launch titles to two <laughs> competing systems. <laughs> Sorry. In one corner, you had the almighty Sega coming off the success of the smashing Genesis slash Mega Drive era. And in the other corner, <laughs> would you look at that? That Walkman manufacturer want to play with the big boys, don't you, Sony? <laughs> What even is a PlayStation anyway? Yes, yes, Sony had the close relationship with Namco, so they was obviously going to be getting Ridge Racer, but Sega? Well, they owned Daytona, and Daytona was doing much better than Ridge Racer in the arcade, so, you know, it's obvious who the winner was here, right? Yep. Ridge Racer. SCES-00001. Sony's first ever video game. And it's with that that I'm going to stop comparing these two titles, because honestly, they're both good games, and they actually do play quite a bit differently to each other. It's just hard not to compare them when all of the magazines at the time were comparing Daytona USA and Ridge Racer. Plus, as a Sega fanboy, it's a tough pill to swallow. The arcade unit of Daytona had started promoting that the game was on its way to home consoles with the Saturn, something that I'm sure arcade owners were not exactly big fans of, as I specifically remember friends of mine at the arcades not choosing to play on that machine due to the fact that they had a Sega Sound on pre-order. Sadly for them, this time, Sega didn't exactly bring the arcade experience home. The game was obviously rushed during development to get it on Sega's new system, and it shows. It runs at an incredibly low 20 frames a second, and sometimes even 15 frames a second. It looks absurdly jagged, and the draw distance looks like it's right in front of your car. 
Thankfully, the gameplay itself actually doesn't take too much of a hit, and despite its rather ugly appearance, AM2 did a pretty good job of bringing the same fast and frantic feel into the home for one player. Yes, one player. One of the most exciting things about the arcade game was multiplayer. I already stated that the single units, I'm not even sure I've ever seen them in real life, but the dual screen or even the eight player setup, <laughs> yes, I saw plenty of those. And that's because even though the gameplay itself is great, taking on your mates is the icing on the most cholesterol heavy cake that you can find. The Saturn ports didn't have this and it got panned heavily for removing it. And yes, a PC port of the same Saturn release also existed, which was marginally better. As retro gaming nostalgic fanboys and look up videos like this, the story of the Saturn's failure comes up a little too often and honestly even though those issues started well before the system's release it was Daytona USA that showed the world at the time that Sega was sadly no longer the dominant force that they once were. Daytona USA Championship Circuit Edition thankfully fixed a lot of these issues and came out just over a year later on the Saturn in 1996 and again in 1997 for PC owners. For me it's two steps forward and one step back kind of game. Yes it has multiplayer, the graphics are much smoother than before, the frame rate is a much better solid 30 frames a second, more cars, more tracks, quite simply is what it should have always been. And funnily enough, this one was released originally in Europe, you know, the place that never wanted a NASCAR game in the first place. Unfortunately, as stated, this version came with a few very noticeable drawbacks, firstly being the fact that the music was remixed. Now, I'm not saying that the music is bad in this one, in actual fact, it's probably arguably better than the arcade original. Don't hate me, it just doesn't include the original soundtrack. Instead, what we have is a remix album mostly done by legendary Sega composer Richard Jacks, apparently due to many European fans complaining that the original OST didn't quite fit the bill. And on behalf of all of us here in Europe, I'm so sorry for messing around this franchise so much, regardless. As stated, it's still a bloody good soundtrack. It just should have had the originals included too. Anyway, besides that, the game itself does feel ever so slightly off. Again, it's not bad, it's quite easy to get to grips with actually, it's just with all of its jumps in visual quality, many will argue that the original Saturn release actually feels more like the arcade than this new polished one. And finally, my biggest issue with this is the fact that it was only released due to the hardcore outcry for a proper Daytona USA home port. That doesn't sound bad until you realise that the team that worked on porting it came off the back of Sega Rally Championship and was actually going to be porting Indy 500 next. And again, I'm not saying that the Indy 500 game is a better game, all I'm saying is that it's a real shame that more people didn't get to experience this awesome little gem, but instead got a slightly upgraded version of a game that came out only one year prior. And if we are going to be getting technical, I have read that the Japanese version of this game, titled Circuit Edition, which came out in 1997, is the version to get, as that is ever so slightly advanced yet again, with further draw distances, a few extra modes, the arcade original soundtrack, slightly refined drift mechanics to make it even more like the arcade original, and most impressive of all was the ability to be able to play this game online. Yes, on a Sega Saturn. Right, that's the original arcade release completely done and the Sega Saturn ports done and dusted. It's now time to move on to the true hidden gem of the series, Daytona USA 2 Battle on the Edge. Seriously guys, this game is so good. Hold up, hold up, hold up ladies and gentlemen. We're not done with the original Daytona USA ports just yet, so I'll have you know. And nope, 
I'm not talking about the Dreamcast or even the PSN download from 2011 either. We'll get to those shortly. But first... Crazily enough, two of these LCD games actually exist. Both extremely similar, but at the same time, both extremely basic. I mean, come on. They are Tiger games. One thing these little systems know how to do, okay, is racing games. And from what I hear, Daytona USA is one of those kind of games. And, well, it's as good as you would expect. Anyway, let's get back on track. It was time to reboot the franchise, and after Sega had sequeled several other top dollar earning franchises such as Virtua Fighter, Fighting Vipers and Virtua Striker, it was time to bring the classic Daytona game back. These were designed on the Sega Model 3 board, which is of course the new most powerful arcade board on the market that Sega made in conjunction with Mitsubishi and Real 3D. Surprisingly, this new arcade board didn't launch worldwide with a racing game. Yes, sure, you had the Boat Race GP, a speedboat game only released in Sega's Joyopolis arcade centers in Japan, which has sadly never been dumped online for fans to play, but a proper arcade game? Nope. And it wasn't until 1996 that we finally got to see what this hardware could do with a game like Daytona USA with the release of Scud Race or Super GP if you're in North America. Now I personally love this game and it's worth shoehorning into this complete history because it's probably never going to get the chance to ever be brought up on this channel again. As you would expect, the roots of the game came from Daytona, USA. However, Toshihiro Nagoshi, who was still the man in charge for this game, along with essentially the same team as before, wanted to make yet another game similar to their previous work, but to make it more accessible on a worldwide scale. Gone was the NASCAR-related theming and looks of the cars, and in their place came real licensed sports cars, including a Porsche 911 used for easy mode, a Ferrari F40 GTE for normal driving, a Dodge Viper GTSR for high torque, and finally, a McLaren F1 GTR for high speed. The tracks were of course completely made up in the fictional world of Versus City, and again, at least in my neck of the woods, this bad boy was a mainstay at the majority of big arcades at the seaside. It may not have had the charm of Daytona USA, but it had its DNA. The game is so incredibly similar, besides its more super polished look and colourful design, and for fans of Daytona USA, you owe it to yourself to check this one out, as just like the next game on our list, this one has never officially been released on home consoles even though it was shown off behind closed doors, running on the upcoming Sega Dreamcast home system. In fact, it is reported that several small sections of the game were found on numerous development kits for the Dreamcast in order to showcase how you can make a game or what the system was capable of. It's a massive shame as it's one of my all-time favourite arcade memories along with those arcade machines that pumped out Captain Jack music along with Daytona USA 2. Yes, Japan did also get Scud Race Plus, a slightly updated version of the original Scud Race that gave racers a new beginner's oval track inside a house and let you ride buses, tanks, a cat and a rocket car. It's all very odd. It's all very... Thankfully, Daytona USA 2 was the game that we all wanted. Made up of about half of the original team, plus a good chunk of people from the back of the Virtua Fighter 3 game. What this essentially did was make a game that felt like it should. You know, that buttery smooth Daytona USA drifting goodness, but also make super impressive for the time 3D models yet again, creating a game that would stand out against the crowd. Everything was built from scratch. It was the perfect continuation from the original and the more wacky side of Scud Race 2. 
The game was conceived after yet another visit to the Daytona Speedway by the team where they took audio from the track itself using shotgun microphones in order to get that realism. But on the flip side, the Midway course is inspired by trips to Walt Disney World and Universal Studios. Sounds to me like they had an awesome holiday in Florida. Purists are obviously still going to argue that the original is the best, but for me, this game is the highlight of the series. Well, that would be the case if it wasn't for the Power Edition. Sega sure do like to make mini upgrades, don't they? And this one is officially Slope's favourite game in the series. Besides the first track's redesign not looking as good in my opinion, the new car helps give this game an even closer to the original feel and therefore makes it, in the words of my fit granny, practically perfect in every way. At one point, Daytona USA 2 was in development for the Dreamcast, as was Scud Race, although that one, as stated, could have just been for tech demo purposes. And also, that particular game was officially sponsored by the BPR Global GT series, which ended only one year later. And as for Daytona USA 2, well, Sega lost the rights to that license only a couple of years after the release of that arcade game. Thankfully, Dreamcast owners were able to get their hands on yet another port of sorts of that original game called Daytona USA 2001, or just Daytona USA depending on where you live, which of course wasn't completely done by Sega due to the licensing, but instead was a joint collaboration between Sega, Hasbro, Infograms, EA and Sierra depending on where you lived. This was a sort of Game of the Year edition of the original game. It featured updated visuals on all of the original cars and tracks, as well as loads of extras that were found on the updated Saturn game, and still a few extra bits and bobs with newfangled remixes and mirrored tracks, just to name a few. The game offered online multiplayer for up to four players, although this was apparently pretty laggy. And best of all, with the power of the Dreamcast, this one is arguably even better looking than the original arcade game. The only problem was that the controls felt very off if you played with the earlier released Japanese version. Thankfully, all Westerners got options to tweak the steering, but sadly we Europeans did lose the online multiplayer option. In this instance, Sega of America most definitely put out the best version that was until 2009. <laughs> Sega Racing Classic is Daytona USA once again, but without all of the Daytona branding. No extras, no nothing. It's literally the exact same game as was that PlayStation 3 and 360 release. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we are finally here with the ultimate version to play, the downloadable game that finally gave the original the respect it deserves. Yes, of course, with such a hardcore fan base behind it, emulation had already done wonders in this arena by this point, but when it comes down to officially released ports, there's no getting around the quality of this download. You've got a few challenges added to an online multiplayer, as well as the usual bump in graphics that you would expect from these consoles. There is very little more that I can say about all this in all honesty. The biggest problem is the fact that it doesn't have local multiplayer, which is of course completely baffling, but besides that, it's pretty perfect, especially if you have a steering wheel as it will adjust its sensitivity depending on what you're going to be using. And there you have it guys, you had some extreme highs and extreme lows and that is everything related to the Daytona USA franchise. <laughs> Okay, let's chat about Daytona USA 3. So, here it is, Daytona Championship USA. How does this game uh, differentiate itself from probably the most uh, uh, popular arcade game of all time, the original Daytona USA? Well, we've uh, made this game as similar to the original game as possible. So, it's got the heart and the soul of the original game. Uh, but the graphics are way better. The gameplay feel is also a lot better. Yep. So, and it's been all up to date for an audience that just loves this classic game. 
Sure, sure. And what's the response been like on this? Honestly, what has the response been like? Phenomenal. Throughout the UK, we've got so many of these all over the US. And... Yep, that's me. Chatting to Sega Amusements directly upon release of Daytona USA 3, eventually released as Daytona Championship USA. By the way, go and support games you love. He was awesome enough to film this segment and thanks to Numskull for bringing me along to this event where I was able to do this very interview. Daytona 3. You can see why they changed the name, right? Upon release, the game was getting some pretty mediocre reviews, not just because of the basic looking graphics for the time, this was 2007 by the way guys, but also because of the handling and the courses itself. The best way I can describe it is that Daytona 3 is essentially the arcades version of one of those Sega Ages PS2 games. Some are great, some are so-so, but they're all ports of the originals with very little extra added. A lot of the charm is missing here visually and the majority of the game itself is simply just reskinned older games in a sexy new cabinet with rather confusing controls. Thankfully Sega Amusements heard our cries and got to work on an update for the arcade cabinet to make it even more like the original. This was done as a download on their very own website and um, it also included the entire game. <laughs> no seriously. Sega gave their own game away to the public and hardcore Daytona fans were not happy with what they were playing. Daytona 3 or Championship USA, whatever you want to call it, was being played by devoted fans and at first everyone saw this as the weakest standalone entry in the franchise primarily because it was just such a bare bones upgrade. Thankfully that update had fixed a lot of the issues found in the original arcade version but still there was no getting around the fact that even though it played almost identically it was yet again a port again. And that's Daytona's biggest problem. It's so good that Sega themselves can't even top it. Sure I prefer the sequels but let me tell you I'm in the minority with that one. This game has become the game of legends, often overlooked as the game that was so good it killed the arcades. Why get anything else when everybody just wants to play this one? Thankfully, even though Sega haven't done too well with the latest release, they have kept the legacy alive, adding tracks in Outrun games, adding the Hornet as a fighting character in Fighting Vipers, playing as an F-14 Tomcat Dreamcast controller and the Hornet again in Sega All-Star Racing Transforms is quite possibly one of the best secret characters ever in my eyes. My god, that game is so good. And finally, Daytona's Hornet was a downloadable add-on in Ridge Racer for the PS Vita. No, seriously. And with that, I think we've gone all the way around the race course and finally made it back to the beginning. more can be said about Daytona USA. It's one of the most legendary arcade games ever, period. Its intoxicating music, its graphics and its gameplay still manages to pull in passers-by over 25 years after its original release and that's why I've chosen to talk about it. Sure, that original is important, but for better or worse, so are its sequels. I think we can all agree that it has some rather damning lows, but you get some genuine hidden gems here that shoot it back up too. And thankfully, from what I've heard on the grapevine, they are all easily playable if you've got a decent enough PC and you know what you're doing. For me, it's one of the most important franchises in Sega's history and of course, as a hardcore Sega fanboy, how could I not give it the complete history treatment? A game so good that it left everything else behind it in the dust, including Sega's own arcade races and depending on who you ask, the entire industry as a whole. Hey there guys, thank you all for checking out Daytona USA The Complete History, spent the last couple of months playing 
<laughs> a lot of Daytona. And um, yeah, I, I mean, it's never a bad time playing Daytona, but I am excited about playing some new games as well, for sure, for sure. Uh, so yeah, thank you all so, so much for checking out this video. Tekken's the ones coming up next. Thank you to Omaze for uh, sponsoring the video. Um, as stated earlier on, there's a link that you can go to down in the description if you guys want to be able to win yourself a Tesla Model S played. Pretty awesome stuff, pretty awesome stuff. And uh, obviously support the awesome charity Reverb at the same time. Not a bad deal, is it? No, no, no. But yeah, thank you to them. And also thank you to all of my supporters that follow me over on uh, uh, YouTube as a YouTube member or as a Patreon. Um, these guys allow me to create videos like this every single week. Um, and I love doing it. I hope you guys are noticing the bump up in quality in these videos. I'm always trying to push myself. And um, yeah, I personally think they're getting better and better. So <laughs> let's give a massive shout out, shall we? To Luke Georgensen, Agro Craig, Lucas Gates, James, Digsy B, Michael Radley Dash, uh, Action Saxon, Christopher Dorero, Roll VP, Jay's Manchild, Daniel Torres, Clan Bob, Mike Fallon, Nicholas Burtner, Taylor Rainwater, Dalton, uh, aka Chevmatic, Jabba Al Adam, Benjamin Guy, Man Shovel, Chris the Shapeshifter, Aaron Gorman, Big Rico, Richard Aldegic, Shadow Dragon, Ryan Holtz, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, Game Apologist, Dina, Lucas Softel, Intrigued Gaming, Ye Old Hamburglar, Jeff Mianowski, Solix Captor, Roven Army, Jeremy Rodriguez, Tim Lunn, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Gary Pinkett, Pretendo64, Conrad Constantine, Andrew Dalton, Richard, um, no, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, King Link reviews tim uh, todd pool float g tim levante 8-bit gamer 88 welcome ian quell knight will samuel nilson matt jackson darren watson josh gibbons that gamer arista dina 81 shade silence mind of the unsane over jal zane stephen cheshire one vike echo rocket plot the cunning linguist and man of god 9000 thank you all so so much for supporting the show i'm not sure how well daytona is gonna do outrun didn't do great so i'm not sure how this one will do all of you guys sharing this content giving it a thumbs up commenting on this video every little thing helps so i really appreciate all your support however you decide to support the show however if you want to support the show financially through patreon or as a youtube member you get to see what i'm working on as i'm working on it and get to see upcoming kick scammer episodes early too not a bad deal is it no 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 <laughs> guys this is dj slope signing out and hopefully i'll see you all next time thank you so much for your support bye bye Thank you.